President of the United States announcing his opposition to lawful subpoenas from Congress. Well, we're fighting all the subpoenas. Look, these aren't like impartial people. The Democrats are trying to win 2020. The only way they can luck out is by constantly going after me on nonsense. That's Trump's take. Here's Bob Mueller's, because he ended his report by intoning, Congress may apply the obstruction laws to the president's corrupt exercise of the powers of office, which accords with our constitutional system of checks and balances and the principle that no person is above the law. Now, Congress uses those powers on a spectrum. It can do nothing, and that happens more often when the same party controls both branches of government, or it can use the oversight functions to hold the executive accountable with hearings, funding measures, or these subpoenas. Or over here, if you want to think of it this way, over here in the special cases, it can apply its congressional removal powers, impeaching federal officials for, as the Constitution provides, treason, bribery, or high crimes. Note tonight that Donald Trump's seemingly aggressive position against Congress using its middle or lesser powers may ultimately provoke some members to use Congress's greater powers. If President Trump takes on Nancy Pelosi over whether he's going to respond to her subpoenas, I will put my money on Nancy Pelosi every time. Amen. We realize that impeachment is a very serious thing, uh, and we're going to do it, do whatever we have to do. But first, we're going to have to do our research, and we're going to do it uh, exceedingly well. We're going to have to do it. We're going to have to impeach. I just wish it was sooner than later. And Hillary Clinton is coming out tonight, and she's calling for a middle ground, at least for right now. Congress should hold substantive hearings that build on the Mueller report and fill in its gaps, she writes not jump straight to an up or down vote on impeachment. Note that the administration is trying to thwart requests for truthful testimony here about matters that range from following up on the Mueller probe, like this appeal to get star witness Don McGahn in front of Congress, to totally separate matters like national security oversight into whether the White House mangled the clearance process to blowing past the deadline for completely different matters like Donald Trump's taxes which are provided for, that the administration has to submit in accordance with federal law to another, trying to prevent an administration official from giving basic facts about a Trump change to the census that might rewire federal funding for decades. When you take it all together, it's only the White House that wants you to believe something that's not true tonight, to believe that this is all about fallout from the Mueller report or potentially sour grapes. What we just walked through are a whole lot of things that any Congress, any co-equal branch will be working on in oversight. Let me welcome Trump chronicler Kurt Anderson, the author of Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, Haywire, and host of the public radio show Studio 360, and Sophia Nelson, who served as counsel to the Republicans House Oversight Committee uh, and has a lot of relevant experience, although despite uh, your GOP history, uh, you are known to be somewhat critical of the president. Thanks to both of you for being here. Yes. Uh, big picture, before we go to the law, let's go to the president. Uh, which Donald Trump are we seeing in these responses? We're seeing the lifelong Donald Trump. We're seeing the Donald Trump who, whose whole MO as a businessman, as a litigant in 4,000 odd lawsuits, uh, as a performer, uh, is to fight, to, to refuse, to deny, to uh, name call. This is what he does, so he is like a pig in muck uh, in this situation. Uh, subpoenas that he can refuse and deny are, are his thing. It's why he is in the WWE Hall of Fame. Mm, you're saying that uh, ignoring lawful requests is sort of his thing. Until, until he does it, until he settles the Trump University suit, until he, until he decides, okay, Move on, but yes, this this is the the the, the oversight. Various congressional committees, House committees, uh, requests uh, will uh, to, to refusing is is just his uh, his act, and he'll he'll happily continue doing that until what whatever happens. The 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 federal marshals come to the Oval Office. We don't know. 
But, Ari, if I may, he's not the Donald Trump of the past. He's the president of the United States of America. He is the executive under Article 2. Congress has Article 1 power, as you know, and they have a right to oversight. In fact, they are required to conduct such oversight. And for the president to spew everything he's been spewing on Twitter over the last 48 hours is awful. He does not take his office seriously. He does not have a clue what the Constitution says. That became very apparent to me. I knew it before, but it's become very apparent as he says he's going to go to the courts to get him out of this. Doesn't work that way, Mr. President. So I think that the Donald Trump we're seeing now, yes, is someone who we've seen before, but he has no clue that his office requires different conduct and that he can and will be held accountable by the Congress. Um, and that he just can't blow it off as he has other things. Well, but it is amazing, Kurt. You're here partly because uh, you've tangled with Donald Trump long before uh, he was seen as a, a potential president. Mm. Didn't you guys at Spy Magazine, you wrote him a check once for a penny to see if he'd cash we it? We wrote him a check for many amounts, uh, down to 13 cents, and he, he cashed every one. Uh, so uh, so let, me take you to, <laughs> let me take you in this direction. What does it mean mm. that after all this and 23 months and his clear fanatic obsession with Mueller, which we now know documented to a degree that he sought to oust Mueller uh, and was warned that would be the end of everything, and people were calling their own lawyers, and to use the president's unfortunate nomenclature, ratting him out to Mueller for that. Uh, those illegal unconstitutional massacres, what Don McGahn called the crazy expletive. Mm. What does it mean that after all this, the New York Times reports, that Donald Trump still isn't reading the Mueller report, um, that he is going to take the the Cliff Notes version from coverage. I mean, I'm, I'm glad if people rely on us, but yeah. Donald Trump not reading the Mueller report, what does that tell you? Well, that he doesn't read, for starters. Um, and, and again, that to my previous point, that he has one switch, one position. It's, it's uh, if, you, if you said anything bad about me, uh, I'm, I hate you. But it's interesting, isn't it, about the Mueller report, that in the same day that he says, it, as he said, Tweeted this morning as he tweets practically every day that it was a it was a angry Democrats the the Mueller report that exonerated him totally and the same day in which Kellyanne Conway his his presidential counselor says oh no the the Mueller report was a was a nonpartisan uh, fair-minded mm -hmm. exoneration therefore Congress doesn't need to continue its oversight the the having it both ways on the same day is is extraordinary well and the Mueller report was not written in its core allegations and evidence by Bob Mueller or by the prosecutors. Uh, something that I think gets lost in these times, although facts do matter and, and we've been documenting it in our coverage, is the Mueller report was written chiefly by Steve Bannon and Chris Christie and Stephen Miller and Don McGahn. It was written by all of the under oath testimony that was corroborated and deemed credible and some of it was thrown out when it was not. Uh, Cohen was cited less than others. But that's who wrote the bulk of the stories, as well as all the documentary evidence uh, where the White House at times was owning itself. So as you say, there are layers and layers to those misrepresentations. And then the reason this is so damaging is precisely because of who it relies on. Both of you stay with me. I'm going to add a little bit of DC to this panel. Natasha Bertrand, national security correspondent for Politico. And joining me for the first time, J.W. Verrett, a former Donald Trump transition staffer who's made waves by announcing that in his view, the Mueller report has changed everything, and he actually believes it's time for impeachment. Uh, thanks to both of you for joining our discussion. Thank you. Uh, JW, what moved you from being someone that was sympathetic to Donald Trump to the point of trying to help him transition into office uh, to turning to impeachment as a remedy based on what you learned in the report? Well, I think the Mueller report clearly documents uh, up to 12 cases of obstruction of justice involving an investigation that in part linked to allegations of treason. So it's squarely within the provision for impeachment in the Constitution. And frankly, what's disappointed me this week is I've come out, I've gone out on a limb here, I think it's fair to say. And I, the Democratic leadership in the House is uh, very wary. I hear a lot of political talk. We're not talking enough about Federalist Paper Number 65. We should be talking about more of that rather than speculating on mm -hmm. politics. So I hope we get a chance to do that here, Ari. Uh, J.W. Verrett dropping some, some founders' bars. Uh, love the Federalist Papers. I, I, I read in your piece um, that you point to Don McGahn as one of those key 
credible witnesses. You say the focus should be on guiding policy decisions and constructive decision in the man in the direction. The man who I most admire was McGahn for the first White House counsel. Uh, what does it tell you that he is cited more than anyone else and that he was moved to pack his belongings and call his personal criminal defense attorney uh, because he was worried that Donald Trump was asking him to do things that would land him or potentially ultimately both of them in jail? Yeah, that's a bad sign. And uh, don't forget, so as we're reading, I, and I hope, I hope a lot of liberals who are talking about the rule of law right now start reading the Federalist Papers. This is a great opportunity to do that, and they're going to learn some things that I think that will be helpful to them. One of them is that the founders intended, James Madison talked about the improper removal of officers as a potential high crime and misdemeanor that could be impeachable. That's all about Comey. Um, so it... It's, it should be about the Constitution and the rule of law. It shouldn't be about political calculus. That's what's been disappointing to me. But uh, the other thing I think everyone's engaged in now, and I think that people will catch up, is just the exercise of reminding them that impeachment is not some magic word of a determination of guilt. It's the beginning of a process. No president has ever been found guilty in a Senate trial. We've had two presidential impeachments. That doesn't mean it's not a, an appropriate exercise for the House, even if you think the Senate's not going to vote uh, uh, your way in the trial. Yeah, let's take that point to Natasha, which is where some of the structural analysis of what's happening here meets the, the raw political realities in the town that, that you're in. Because Natasha, as you know, if you applied the way some Democrats and certainly Speaker Pelosi and Chuck Schumer have talked to other, other avenues, you wouldn't have a groundswell for an early Barack Obama candidacy because you'd say, well, uh, the predictions are it's not clear that person would become president. You wouldn't have AOC as a member of Congress because the statistical political predictions about de defeating an incumbent, Mr. Crowley, who was number four in leadership in a blue city, uh, would have told you it's unlikely. Uh, I guess I will put it as, as nicely as I can as a news anchor. Why the heck should it matter what people in D.C. predict the politics of impeachment are? Shouldn't it be about uh, whether it's right or not? And if it's not right, then that's the reason not to do it. Well, this is, of course, the debate that's raging um, among the Democrats right now. And actually, some people might say that it's not actually raging, that it's just a few very loud voices who are calling for impeachment. And it's the majority of Democrats, mainstream Democrats, who are saying, no, let's hold off, let's hold hearings, let's examine the evidence even more. And then once public opinion maybe starts to shift a bit more into you know, being in favor of an impeachment proceeding, then we will start to discuss launching an impeachment proceeding. But, you know, the argument well, on the other side... Let me ask you about that, because that that goes to your theory of politics, Natasha. I mean, that goes back to every grassroots debate you ever have is do you see politics and political figures, be they in office or out, as thermostats or thermometers? I mean, are they mm -hmm. taking the temperature after all this? Isn't the temperature out there that a lot of people are concerned about Donald Trump? What more temperature taking do they need to do? Right. And the criticism I want to be very careful about how I have this discussion as a journalist, but the criticism has been that the you know, Republicans have been playing politics and that the Democrats have tried to put themselves beyond politics. So they're acting in a very hypocritical way by making all of these po political strategic calculations in a way that, of course, is going against the very thing that most Democrats voted them into office in November um, was about, which is holding the president accountable. And after the Mueller report came out, it seems like the Democrats just didn't really have a cohesive strategy here to deal with everything that was in it, maybe because they didn't realize how bad it would be for the president. But, you know, the, the uh, approach that Nancy Pelosi seems to be taking now is the, the Nixon approach, where they started launching um, hearings around May of 73, and it took about a year um, of those hearings for them to start saying, OK, we're threatening mm -hmm. you with impeachment. And then Nixon, of course, resigned roughly two weeks later. But that seems to be what they're waiting for, for public opinion to shift right. here. But and of course, me... an impeachment proceeding might do the shifting. Well, yeah, exactly. Opinion. Who's going to do the shifting? Let me bring Kurt in. I mean, I, I think for Democrats who have said in, in Congress, we're waiting for the evidence. Well, now there's voluminous evidence. Uh, there, you know, there's reporting today out of Washington, oh, some Democrats are saying what Trump is tweeting now and doing now could be a new witness tampering charge. OK, but what do you do with the evidence you have? And don't you owe the public a discussion of, well, it's not enough. We're not doing it or we are. Well, and and there is the the moral high ground of, by God, it's the rule of law. And if it's impeachable, we should impeach him. However, I also think there is a political argument for taking that position, which is to say 
As William Goldman famously said about the movie business, nobody knows anything. Nobody knows what's going to work when you open a movie. I really, really honestly think that's true of the political calculus about what an, an impeachment hearing, beginning impeachment hearings, let alone impeachment, would or wouldn't do to help or hurt Democrats or Trump. I don't think anybody knows. So. I, I, I would say that the, the, there's, there's political arguments for the impeachment without regard for, for politics because the pol you don't know the politics. See, where I'm struggling is this isn't a political argument. This has to be about the Constitution and what is the best avenue for the republic to keep standing. One of the things that people forget about the founders, and your first guess is that Jay was right. First of all, Jay, JW. But I think sometimes he goes by J Dub. Well, J. First of all, oh, the big true? bad J Dub. <laughs> what was it? Oh, big the big bad, bad J Dub. Yeah. Hey, hey. Jay, thank you for your courage <laughs> because you did take a courageous stand. And Federal 65 is a very good place to start. But what I want to say is what people forget is that the founders believed in a moral and virtuous government or moral and virtuous yeah. leaders. And we can debate what they meant by those terms. But certainly the conduct outlined in the Mueller report, certainly the conduct we've seen from this president for the last two years, but particularly the last 48 hours or so, does not fit in to the conduct that Lindsey Graham talked about that was impeachable when it was Bill Clinton. I worked on government reform and oversight during those days, during the Clinton years, with the subpoenas flying and, and the talk about the Clintons doing all kind of things that were wrong. And they cooperated. For the most part, the Clinton White House turned over the documents. They came under oath. They testified, et cetera. So I just want to say that it's not about the politics. It has to be about what's right for the republic. And that's what it has to be about. And, and JW, before I let you go, your first time on the beat, what is the reception you've gotten for what you've said? And have you heard from any other conservatives or Republicans privately uh, who agree with you? Yeah, I've got my inbox has been my email in, inbox has been very interesting uh, this week. Uh, from, I guess, let's say the grassroots uh, Trump supporters. Uh, but for the most part, I've gotten a lot of support, and the Republicans I know personally have all been very supportive privately. And one thing I'll add to impeachment is it's a whole different thing when you start appearing before congressional committees and Trump says, my DOJ won't go after you. And you start thinking, what about the next DOJ for noncompliance with the subpoena? What about losing my bar license? It's a whole different ball game in terms of finding facts. Yeah, I think with finding facts and also taking things up out of the footnotes and presenting with the public again, if the Congress yes. thinks that's valid. In other words, the Democrats have the have the position of having run on this and made a big deal about it. Is it something they want to put forward in a fact finding process? If not, um, then you start to end up back where Donald Trump started this, at least this segment of our broadcast, which is all right, leave it alone and move on to other things. Uh, certainly, it shouldn't be endless subpoenas without an actual plan. Uh, Kurt Anderson, Sophia Nelson, Natasha Bertrand, and Big J-Dub Verrett. <laughs> Thanks to each of you. Uh, hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.